Hello, I'm Dave Mowitz and welcome to Successful Farming. On today's program, I take an in-depth look at prices being paid for Case IH quad track four-wheel drive tractors. Then we feature a great shop invention from Ohio. The engine answer man, Ray Bohax, is back with another one of his great repair tips. And after these brief messages, I discuss tractor tire replacement strategies with Tom Rogers of Firestone Tire. So please stay tuned. Today on Top Shops, I'm at Firestone's Farm Tire Test Center in Columbia, Ohio, talking to Tom Rogers with Firestone. And we're talking about tire, tire performance. Uh, previous episodes of Successful Farming, we've talked about tire uh, ballasting, weighting, tire inflation. And for those segments, our viewers can go to agriculture.com slash TV to view those. But Tom, a lot has changed with farm tires, particularly on this creature right here, the, the uh, tractor. Because back in the day when I first started writing stories about farm tire usage and selection, it was the bias ply. And then we went to that change to the big R, the radial mm -hmm. tire. And now things have even changed on the nomenclature on the side of the tire and also the design of the tire. So talk to me a little bit about what's happened to the farm tractor tire. So, and you're right, in the, the 30 years you talked about and, and over the, the last few decades, uh, things have gotten a lot bigger, firstly, right? So, oh, you have 500 horsepower tractors. Our capacities of combines and things like that have all grown. Every time something grows, we need a bigger tire to carry that load uh, and, and effectively carry the load. So the complexity of the ag business in that regard, as well as uh, specialized applications, you know, self-propelled sprayers 30 years ago didn't really exist. So we have narrow tires for that. We have row crop tires for, uh, for tractors. We have big wide tires for carts and combines. So that complexity and that, that offering of all these applications has really grown the tire side of our business. Boy, in one area that we've seen that uh, a lot of engineering going to tires certainly has been on the tractor tire because We've gotten into the, the new generation of, of uh, radios, which are IF and VF right. tires. And remind me again, what's the difference between those two? So you're right, and you referenced bias uh, originally, then we went to radials. The next step has been this IF and VF technology, which is a, a industry standards established by Tire and Rim. And, and IF basically means if you have a like size, and you have an IF version of it, the IF version will carry 20% more load at the same inflation pressure as that standard radial. Take it one step further, VF will carry 40% more load oh. than the same standard tire at the same pressure. So it's, you're getting a lot greater capacity, but you're carrying, you're, the tire's deflecting and squatting more because you're not adjusting the pressure and raising it. Yeah. So you're Right, and your dealer's not just trying to upsell you what he's saying for the performance you want out of your tractor, you may want to go to a VF. Exactly, so it gives you a bigger footprint, uh, gives you better traction, gives you a better ability to carry that load and not, uh, not have as much compaction. And at the same time, so we've had to design that tire basically to run at a greater deflection than, than a standard radial or the bias previous, so. So how do you do that with this creature here? I mean, what did you do to this thing to try to get it to run with 40% more capacity, like with the VF tire? Right, so, and, and a lot of it is, is, is interior design of what we do in the body of the tire, but, but we're really adding components and, and changing the way the tire is constructed, again, to carry it at a greater squat or a greater deflection. And that always is something that kind of startles people when you see that, that, that squat that the tire has. But in essence, what we've designed is for it to run in that position. Now, the complexity of tire selection as well as how you go about ballasting the tractor, how you go about inflating the tractor, it really has gotten to be very specific to usage of like the tractor and then also the tractor itself. 
Um, we've covered that in previous segments before, but is there a site where they can get more information about that aspect of things? Right, so you can go to our website, firestoneag.com. That'd be a great resource to, to learn more about tire capacities, tire sizes, dimensions, what the load and inflation tables are, the differences between IF and VF, and uh, there's a technology tab there as well where you can you can find some of this information out, especially about new uh, new offerings. And when in doubt, go to your tire dealer because he'll help you. Absolutely, even a better resource, your tire dealer, and, and he's experienced especially in the way things are in a, a given geography, and he knows all of what we're talking about here. Well, there's other aspects to tires too that really is timing farmers is stubble damage. And that's been plaguing guys for a while since we got into the GMO. Uh, we beefed up uh, these uh, plants, especially soybeans. We've created bayonets in the field <laughs> as we've taken corn off with uh, the green stem that it has or the greener stalk. What are we gonna do about tire damage? So it's a, it is a challenge and it's a challenge for the tire industry and uh, no question because as you mentioned, these GMO crops or have this standability that we wanted. Yeah. The standability still exists even after harvest. And, and the problem is we use a durometer to measure hardness. And if you take the durometer of a corn stalk versus the durometer of the rubber on our tire, the tire is softer than the corn stalk. Now, Firestone was instrumental long, well, over a decade ago, uh, working to create a thing called a stubble stomper. But is that still in usage? Is that something you want to do? Or is there other things that you can utilize? So, Absolutely, yeah. The the and we continue today. Our our compounders and our folks uh, at our Akron Tech Center, uh, we're continuing to work on harder compounds and more durable compounds. And it's it's a trade-off, though. We talked a lot about how we want this tire to flex and squat and and move. Uh, the harder you make the rubber, the less it wants to do that. So there's a there's a trade-off. So we understand that we're doing a lot of things to to make it and continue to improve how it reacts against stubble. But the other is, and we teach our dealers and we train farmers is just avoiding it. You know, don't drive right down the row. Have a mechanism on your combine, stubble stompers that push the stalk over. So it's definitely proven that a rigid corn stalk or rigid soybean stalk versus one that's just been broken over uh, is much more likely to damage a tire. So if we can break it over, we start to really minimize the, the longer term effect on the tire. I've got to ask about the location that we're at. This is the Farm Tire Test Center. It's the only Farm Tire Test Center in the country? It is, and it's, yeah, it's one of our pride and joys in the Firestone Ag family, that's for sure. So what do you do to tires out here? <laughs> you, you kind of beat the hell out of them. We, we try to destroy them, uh, uh, and, and we, we push them to the limits, maybe is the best way to put it, uh, or beyond the limits, and I think it, it tells us how long it'll last? Will it does, it, does it reach what we feel like is a lifetime validation? And, and before any tire ever makes it to a farm, uh, of a farmer or a customer, it's been to our farm here, and we've, we've run it through that gauntlet to make sure it's gonna survive. Yeah, because you have all these buildings with their torture t uh, chambers, as it, and then tethered tractors run around the concrete. But what's really fun about this site, it's, it's Harvey Firestone's originally far, original farm. Exactly, uh, Harvey Firestone was from Columbiana, so this is part of his original farmstead. Uh, the land that we work and we do our testing on and we do traction testing in his original fields. So there's a lot of history. The, the One of our buildings here, uh, an old hay barn, is the oldest physical structure in Bridgestone Corporation, built in 1840. Wow. Uh, today it's our conference room and, and a museum, which actually houses one of Harvey Firestone's yeah. restored tractors. So the, his, the place just oozes history. So if I want to take a tour of that, how would I do that? So we do, and we, we have uh, training here. We do a lot of tours with our dealers and original equipment folks. Uh, probably the best way is to work, contact your local tire dealer, have him get a hold of his area rep, and we, we could probably go through that process. Tom, thanks for that information. Also, to explain how you can get a tour of this historic site. I'll see you again on another Top Shop Tour. Hi, Ray Bohax here, the successful farming engine man and I'm on location in Columbia and Ohio at the Firestone Farm Tire Test Facility. These guys know a lot about tires, but what we're gonna be talking about today is stopping that tire. We're gonna be talking about drum brakes. And I'm gonna talk about drum brake service on any drum brake system. I don't care whether it's on a trailer, this obviously is a backing plate and shoes for a trailer or electric solenoid, but whether it's a pickup truck, a combine, 
a car, a truck, what have you, if it has drum brakes, the tips that I'm going to show you today uh, will all apply. Now, the thing that we have to realize is that with a drum brake system, that whether it's hydraulic or electric, as this one, there's a certain amount of energy that is required to move the shoes out against the drum. Now, keep in mind that if there is a lot of friction there, that's a parasitic loss of energy. And with that parasitic loss of energy, instead of you having that energy to stop the vehicle or the trailer, it's being used to move the shoe. And it's very simple to be able to correct that problem. Now, sadly, this is a brand new trailer brake setup, and it's not put together properly. And what I mean by that, yeah, the springs are in the right place, the solenoid's in the right place, everything is in the right place, but they forgot the most important thing. And they did not lubricate the backing plate. So what I'm gonna show you today is how you could actually do a brake job without doing a brake job. Not only will this give you better stopping ability, but it'll have the shoes last longer because they will return and not drag. And it's very, very simple. There are, you could use any type of grease, but there are actually application-specific greases for drum brake shoes, for the, pivot, for the slide points. This is an old can of Bendix grease that I have. What you have to do is you have to look at the assembly, and you have to realize that the shoe is going to slide against the backing plate, over here, over here, and over here, and it's also going to work against the anchor, and it's going to work against the adjuster, and if there was a wheel cylinder instead of a solenoid, it's gonna work there. If this is not lubricated, then what's gonna happen is that the energy, the hydraulic energy from a hydraulic braking system is gonna be consumed just to try to move the shoe against the friction. Now, what you could do is very simple. If you're taking the wheels off to check the brakes on something, and you'll see that the grease is, has dissipated or melted or was never there, you could take a screwdriver and just pry the shoe back. You would, it's gonna be a little bit hard for me to do this on TV. You would need two hands, and then, because I have to hold this up, and put the grease behind the shoe, put the grease over here at the pivot point, and then down by the adjuster and obviously grease the adjuster. This will greatly improve the safety of the vehicle or the piece of farm equipment. It'll allow the shoe to actually slide very easily against the backing plate and will allow all of that potential energy to be used to stop that piece of equipment, that car, that truck, or that trailer. If I could be of any help to you with brakes, anything else, any advice on your farm equipment, please feel free to contact me at sfengineman at agriculture.com. And I wish you a safe and blessed day. And please remember to lubricate those slide points. Are you looking for a late model Case IH quad track for your operation? Then join me at auction to see what they are going for. So please stay tuned. Welcome to Steel Deals. While roaming the lines of machinery up for sale at a dealer inventory reduction sale, I came across this Case IH 450 quad track. What attracted me to this particular machine was the fact that it's a 2013 model with just 914 hours. Case IH made these tractors up to 600 horsepower. Models in the 500 to 600 horsepower range were the most popular. So much so that the 450 horsepower machine like this tractor are fewer in numbers. Will that put upward pressure on bidding today? Or are low commodity prices continuing to depress values on late model large tractors? That certainly has been the case since the summer of 2014. I'll say this much about this particular quad track. It is in excellent condition and very well maintained and well equipped as well with 30 inch tracks, six hydraulic outlets, a thousand PTO, luxury cab and HID lighting. This tractor would be an ideal addition to a mid-sized to a large farming operation. I'm gonna go talk to one of the representatives with Sullivan Auctioneers, the organization putting on today's sale, what they think this tractor will bring today. We're talking with Matt Sullivan of Sullivan Auctioneers who's putting the auction today and Matt, there's this 450 quad track back here. Now that's kind of the, the lower horsepower of the quad track, mm -hmm. but hard to find those. Do you think that's gonna kind of 
put a little price floor on the on the tractor today? I think so. It, it has really good hours and it has a PTO, which it, which when when you're looking for those tractors seems to be the most uh, desirable option. So I think it'll help it. Now, because this is a track machine for a guy that maybe has never bought one used before, do you really kind of have to spend some time taking a look at the tracks and examining that for the wear and tear, or typically are they pretty bulletproof? No, I'd say typically they're pretty bulletproof. You know, they've made those tractors for a long time and, and had pretty good success with it. But, but also, you know, as a buyer, you want to do your homework and, and make sure you check it over to the best of your ability to know what you're getting into. You know. How does this vary as a sale because this is a dealer inventory reduction sale. It's not like these come along all the time. That's right, right. It's a, I think it's a very unique opportunity to, to, get a, to purchase some equipment. You know, there's, there's financing and, and you can get all the history of the equipment and know where it's coming from. Right. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. Any idea what you'd bid on a tractor like this? Do you think you could buy it? Well, I think on a 450 quad like that with very low hours and a PTO, I think, you know, I think 225 to 250,000 is is, would be a good buy on that tractor. Well, thanks for that information, Matt. Let's watch the quad track sell. <laughs> The final bid on our 2013 Quad Track 450 was $221,000. Now, how does that compare to other machines up for sale at dealers' lots? Bear in mind that dealer asking prices are going to be higher than today's final bid. I found just three 2013 Quad Tracks equipped like this tractor. A tractor with just 282 hours was up for sale at a dealer's lot in Indiana for $273,500. Then there was a 450 in Missouri with over 1,400 hours. It had an asking price of 269,000. Finally, there was a 450 at a dealership in Kansas with a price tag on it of 269,500. That tractor had 1,100 hours on its tack. And what about recent auction sales at 2013 450 quad tracks? I found 450 similar to this machine that brought final bids of 185,000 up to 193,000 dollars. See, that's the benefit of the internet. You can go to websites like machinefinder.com, ironsolutions.com, rbauctions.com, and do some comparison shopping. And you can catch my machine, Insider Equipment Price Trend Analysis, and every issue of Successful Farming. See you next week on another Steel Deals Report. After these brief messages, we travel to Ohio to feature a great shop storage idea. So please stay tuned.
Yeah, I'm Jay Clark. Uh, we live in the southeast of Ohio, and uh, we raise some corn, beans. Uh, we rent some of the farm out. When we built the shop in 2001, uh, put an overhead storage facility in it, and uh, put shelving up there, and decided I needed a handrail on the outside edge to keep people from walking off the, the uh, platform there. So uh, in a, the way I done it was put uh, joist hangers on my shelving and uh, cut two before it's the length and just dropped them down in there. And that way I can remove them, take them out and pick anything up off the floor here of the shop with the crane and, and put it up there if need be or pick stuff up up there and bring it back down with the crane. The advantage to it is just the easy access to the loft and back and forth with the crane and servicing the crane you need to get up there too to to uh, grease and uh, clean the crane and it's just an easy way to get up there and, and work on it. Uh, the expense was minimum uh, maybe thirty dollars for the joist hangers and uh, a little bit of two befores which a lot of it was excess already had here laying around so I wouldn't change anything it it worked the first time uh, I like it <laughs> it works for me. For more ideas like this, go to agriculture.com slash TV. Please join us next week for another outstanding show. The product test team is back. Our exclusive team of farmer evaluators will be reporting on the latest in cordless tool advances. I spend the day at auction to track the sale of John Deere 8310R tractors. The shark farmer, Rob Sharkey, is back offering his unique perspective on agriculture. See you next week, right here on Successful Farming. Hi, I'm Dave Mowitz. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, hit subscribe right here if you haven't already, and click that little bell right here to be notified when we post a new video. And click here to see more great episodes from Successful Farming Television.